Budapest is a city of which I have many fond memories, having spent several years of my life living there. It's a city of two halves, the rolling hills of Buda being divided from the Hungarian plain and the city of Pest by the Duna, the Danube River. It's a city marked by bridges, the castle district on the western bank, and the stunning parliament buildings on the eastern bank. But while I'm sitting here with my fond memories of a city I love, you may be asking yourself why I'm talking about Budapest. Well, from a Cold War context, the city played host to a pivotal event in the course of the conflict. Budapest in 1956 witnessed the first serious attempt by a country inside the Soviet sphere of influence to break free from the chains of Moscow. This was an event that would, when all was said and done, loom large in the minds of other nations, in East and West until 1989, when we get to the end of our Cold War story. I'm your host David, and today we are going to be setting the stage for the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. This is the Cold War. Now, as you all remember, we did a video about a year ago on the Sovietization of Hungary in the post-war period. So we aren't going to go into detail on that process, but we do need to recap a little bit in order to properly explain how and why the revolution happened. By 1949, the Hungarian Working People's Party, headed by Rakosi Matyas, was firmly in control of Hungary. All other political parties were banned, the country had been renamed a People's Republic, and a constitution modeled on the 1936 Soviet constitution had been adopted. Symbolically, communist emblems had been included into the national flag and the coat of arms. Rakosi, the self-declared best disciple of Stalin in Hungary, enjoyed almost unlimited power, largely the result of his strong relationship with the top Soviet leadership, particularly Stalin. Of course, it hadn't always been Rakosi as the uncontested head of Hungarian communism. In the years immediately after the Soviet liberation of Hungary, there were two centers of power in the Hungarian communist movement. There were the communists who had operated against the wartime Horthy government, and then the Nazi occupation. This faction was led by a man named Roik Laszlo, and was far more popular than the second faction, the Moscow communists, who had been in exile in the Soviet Union during the war years, and had only returned in the wake of the Red Army's arrival. This was the faction led by Rakosi, but was also made up of prominent post-war politicians such as Gera Erna, who became the Minister of Finance. This split between Rakosi and Reich, driven by the threat Reich posed to Rakosi's leadership, eventually came to a head in 1949 when Rakosi had Reich arrested on charges of espionage. He was accused of spying on behalf of Stalin's now arch-nemesis, Josip Broz Tito. Roik was tried and, naturally, found guilty of participation in a plot against Rakoshi and Gero. He was then executed in a fit of oppression worthy of the evil mustache man in Moscow. Included in the waves of arrests that followed was the Minister of the Interior, Gadar Janos. Remember that name for later. Now, that wave of oppression, it's been estimated that over 2,000 people were deemed a mix of class enemies, spies, deviants, and or saboteurs, and were subsequently executed. On top of this, over 100,000 people were imprisoned and tens of thousands were sent into labor camps. This included Hungarians who were deemed to be bourgeois, members of the intelligentsia, aristocrats, and former members of the old regime. Now, those are designations you might expect to find, but also among those arrested were members of the Hungarian Workers' Party who opposed Rakosi's methods or what he stood for. This was a purge. At the same time this was going on, Rakosi was developing a cult of personality with himself at the center, and his friend Stalin, of course. Busts, monuments, and portraits of both men began to appear across the country. All public speeches and even academic writings were mandated to make glowing references to both men. Those loyal to the regime, however, were rewarded, while at the same time those deemed not loyal were punished. Over 26,000 people from the middle and upper class in Budapest were forcibly removed from their homes 
to make way for members of the Hungarian Communist Party. Rákosi began to reshape the economy of Hungary along Stalinist principles. This was always going to be a difficult task, as Hungary was forced to pay reparations to the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia for the role it had played as a member of the Axis. In 1946, the Hungarian National Bank estimated reparation payments at between 19 and 22 percent of the annual national income. This is of course where we would mention Marshall Plan aid coming to the rescue, except Hungary declined to participate in the Marshall Plan on ideological grounds. So what did the Hungarian economy look like? Rakosi, like the true Stalinist he was, focused economic investment and development on heavy industry at the expense of Hungary's traditional strengths such as textile manufacture and agriculture. This was done because heavy industry, and not cloth, was the only way to prepare for the upcoming global war against the capitalists. Now, we have to point out that not only was Hungary moving away from its strong suit, but much of the raw output of its new industries was largely being sent off to the Soviet Union for use there. When all of this was combined with the purging of many of the country's economic professionals, serious problems began to occur. The real income of Hungarian workers in 1952 had dropped by two-thirds when compared to 1938 figures. And then 1953 rolled around. We pointed out in a past video that it was a monumental year because the tanky-in-chief died. Obviously, the repercussions were not just felt in the Soviet Union, but in the satellite states as well, Hungary certainly being no exception. Like a magical golden ring to rule them all, to find them all, to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them, when that ring was destroyed, things began to crumble. In Hungary, the cult of personalities surrounding both Stalin and Rakoshi began to be questioned, criticized, and even rejected. As new power dynamics began to assert themselves in the Kremlin, new people and positions gained influence. Rakoshi, as a devout Stalinist, found his position becoming more and more unstable. Unpopular at home due to the waves of repression and the economic mismanagement, in July of 1953, Rakoshi was forced by Moscow to step down as the Prime Minister, although he still retained his position as the first secretary of the Hungarian Workers' Party. He was replaced as Prime Minister by another of the Moscow exiles, Noj Imre. Nudge set about trying to liberalize both the economic and political situation in the country. He began to steer the economy back towards consumer goods, rather than heavy industry, and reduced the taxation rate on peasants, all in an effort to increase living standards. Political prisoners were released, forced labor camps were closed, and members of the Communist Party who had been expelled were allowed back into the party. Peter Gabor, the leader of the AVH, the State Protection Authority, or the secret police, was arrested and put in prison. The AVH had been responsible for the carrying out of the waves of repression and had a reputation for both cruelty and brutality. So things are looking up for Hungary at this point, right? Well, politics in Moscow being what they were, the answer to the question is no. Just as Rakoshi was tied to Stalin, Nudge was tied to Malenkov, who, you of course recall, seemed ascendant in the period after Stalin's death. However, as Khrushchev gained the upper hand in the Kremlin, Nudge's power diminished to the point that Rakoshi was able to stage a comeback in Budapest. Rakoshi, still first secretary, continued to wield a great deal of influence, and he used a massive propaganda campaign to accuse Nudge of economic mismanagement. Nudge was forced to retire as a result. And then the secret speech happened. As Khrushchev solidified his power in Moscow by turning on Stalinism and those most publicly associated to it, Rakoshi's position in Hungary was again on shaky ground. So much so that in July 1956, Rakoshi was forced to step down from all his political offices and he actually fled to the Soviet Union where he lived for the rest of his life. Gera Erna took over as first secretary, a move that proved to be very unpopular with many Hungarians. Of course, as we set the stage for the revolution that was to come, it's also important to factor in a few more details. Stalin's death, the secret speech, and the start of the thaw 
did not only have an impact on the Soviet Union and on Hungary, but on many of the countries behind the Iron Curtain. Poland, for example, saw the death of its Stalinist leader, Bolesław Beirut, in 1956, and in the wake of mass protests in the city of Poznan, the reformist politician Władysław Gomułka was allowed to take over, giving more local control to Poland. Along with this, a large number of Soviet army troops were withdrawn from the country. How could Hungary not see this and hope for similar? Polish successes emboldened not only Hungarian reformers, but also students, members of the intelligentsia, and moderates across the country. Public forums began to be organized discussing the challenges of the country, as well as how to tackle and fix those challenges. These so-called Betefi circles, named after the national poet and hero of the Revolution of 1848, Betefi Sándor, attracted thousands of participants. On October 6, 1956, Roik Laszlo, executed in 1949, you'll remember, was reburied in a ceremony that attracted huge crowds. Spurred on by the prospect of reform, student groups began to organize themselves. Hungary, a country with a long tradition of revolution, successful or not, was waking up. Following years of military dictatorship, war, and destruction, of occupation, and now communist dictatorship, momentum was building for change to occur in the country. Led by a government that was both unstable and unpopular, the country faced deep economic challenges. No longer restrained by the threat of direct Stalinist force, the discontent of the people was boiling up, bolstered by the positive changes they were witnessing in other Eastern European nations. Hungary and Hungarians felt that change was now possible. The stage was set for the dramatic and deadly events that were to play out in October and November of 1956. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Cold War. We will be bringing you the second part of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution soon, so to make sure you don't miss it, please be sure you're not only subscribed to the channel, but have a press the bell button. As always, we're available via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com and are also active on both Facebook and Instagram. Please consider supporting us financially via YouTube membership or via Patreon at www.patreon.com slash the Cold War. Any support you may be able to provide is greatly appreciated. This is the Cold War channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.